it can give you something to be proud of when you don't have anything to be proud of. How art is helping people work through their mental health struggles. When you're diagnosed with cancer as a young adult, it is very isolating. Chick Mission, the organization giving women with cancer a chance to preserve their fertility. And a different type of therapy is striking a chord with young patients. Welcome to Ion Health, where we focus on stories that affect your physical and mental well-being. I'm Bradley Blackburn. Hurricane Helene is one of the deadliest storms in U.S. history, and a new study suggests even beyond the initial toll, major weather events are an indirect driver of thousands more deaths. Stanford University researchers analyzed data from hundreds of tropical cyclones between 1930 and 2015. They found 7,000 to 11,000 early deaths in the 15 years after each storm. These are people who are suffering from health issues that they may not realize are associated with the storm in some way, but which we can see in the data, they would not have died uh, you know, at those times had the storm not arrived. Climate economist Solomon Shung says more study is needed on exactly how the storms contribute to deaths. What this means is that we need to think through how we respond to storms in the long term, after the fact, how these communities are supported afterward, what services are provided. From a broader public health standpoint, we haven't really been thinking about hurricanes as a major threat to public health. We sort of see them as an inconvenience that is tragic for a small number of community members. But right now in the Southeast, the focus with Helene is on the immediate health needs and a massive rush to save lives. That includes Atrium Health's Med One Mobile Emergency Department, which launched to try on North Carolina. The Trauma Center on Wheels includes nurses, doctors, trauma surgeons, paramedics, and other essential staff. I spoke with Dr. David Calloway, Atrium's Chief of Crisis Operations and Sustainability, to learn more about how they're helping Helene's victims. Dr. Calloway, why is a resource like this, a mobile resource, so needed in this situation? With these extreme weather events like we saw in Western North Carolina, what often happens and what we saw is that entire communities have gone offline. So they've lost power, they've lost cell service, they've lost water. Um, and many of the people who are working in these hospitals to take care of patients have also lost their own home. And so what an advanced capability like our mobile hospital can do is we can move into communities, basically provide top end, high quality care that offsets a hospital that's been destroyed, a hospital that's offline, or a hospital that just needs a little extra help so that their staff can go and make sure um, that their own homes and families are doing all right. What kind of patients can you treat in the med one? Uh, what sort of conditions is it designed for? Literally, we can treat any condition that you would see at a level one trauma center. So in this uh, mobile hospital, we have 14 beds. They are monitored. Um, and then we have an operating room. So we can treat heart attacks, strokes, trauma patients, people who need minor surgical procedures. Uh, God forbid if we had to do a, a large surgery, we could, um, but we can treat everything. And doctor, it's not just for emergency care, it's also for people that have ongoing routine needs, right? That are disrupted potentially if their local provider goes offline? Absolutely, absolutely. And we have a full stock pharmacy. Um, in addition, we have the ability to call back to um, Atrium Health, which is now part of the third largest health system in the country. And so we can flex resources based upon what the need is during a disaster deployment. So when we get there in the first few days, they're often trauma patients. Then there's a little bit of a lull. Then we see really sick medical patients who haven't been able to get care. And then we see larger volumes of people like you just described who need slightly more than routine care. They need a checkup. They need their medications refilled. They're, they're sick. Um, but they don't need to be in a hospital. We can deploy uh, providers and we can expand to hold up to 600, sorry, up to 300 patients with our tents. Um, and then if we partner with federal assets, we can go larger up to 600. And so we can, we can either see patients and, and, uh, and discharge them home. We can see patients and discharge them back to a, a medical shelter. We can see patients and we can hold them overnight if we need to. Tell me a little bit more about how the facility works. This is a, a system of trucks, right, that all link together. And, uh, and it's, so explain to me sort of the logistics of bringing it together. So we have, a, we have a fleet of trucks. The core is the one behind me, which is the hospital truck. 
we then have um, a, a bathroom truck. We have a sleeping truck. We have um, a food capability. We have a logistics and command truck. We have our own satellite link. We have generators that are uh, built into the semi so that we can be self-sufficient for 72 to 96 hours. Um, and when we set this up, it's set up as an entire compound. Um, so really, when you walk in um, or are brought in, you feel like you're in a regular brick and mortar hospital. Um, and we hear this all the time from our patients, especially ones who live out um, when we've responded to hurricanes out in eastern North Carolina um, and people have been used to getting cared for in a tent during disaster. After uh, you know 30 minutes in, in Med 1, they, they frequently say, we feel like we're in a hospital. And that gives them a little bit of a sense of normalcy that just is, is really a powerful uh, psychological boost uh, when, when they're facing such a crisis. All right, Dr. David Calloway with Atrium Health, thank you for your time and for the life-saving work that you and your colleagues are doing. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about the team. A new report from the American Cancer Society shows a significant drop in breast cancer death rates over the past 30 years. But not all women are benefiting from the advances in early detection and treatment. Stephanie Stahl explains. It's been seven years since Kathleen Bailey was diagnosed with breast cancer. The then 52-year-old was getting regular mammograms and had a lump that for years her doctor said was nothing to worry about. A new doctor suggested a biopsy. And there's no breast cancer in my family, so I was actually shocked. Like, what the heck? I exercise regularly, I eat right, and I got breast cancer. Kathleen is among a group of women breast cancer is affecting disproportionately. An American Cancer Society report finds breast cancer incidence is rising by 1% annually, with the steepest increase for Asian American, Pacific Islander women of all ages. Really quite significant difference. So this is something that is causing us concern. The report also shows that rates in AAPI women under 50 have been increasing and are now higher than Black, Hispanic, American Indian, and Alaska Native women. The kinds of studies that you conduct in order to identify cancer risk are called cohort studies, following healthy individuals over their lifetime and truly tracking everything, their health history, their eating habits, their exercise habits, their family history. Our cohort is studying 306,000 women of all populations across the United States. I was part of a, a focus group here in Hawaii for specifically Hawaiian and Filipino women. Kathleen's cancer had not spread when it was finally detected. She had surgery and radiation. I'm in remission. I finished the hormone therapy, the five years of hormone therapy, and have been doing my regular mammograms. She also tries to reduce her stress and encourages other women to get routine checkups. Stephanie Stahl, CBS News. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The Eiffel Tower was lit up in pink to mark the start of the annual Pink October campaign. Here in the U.S., a survivor is giving young women hope when it comes to their fertility. Chick Mission helps young women who have recently been diagnosed with cancer preserve their fertility. Eggs are removed and saved before treatments that can cause infertility. When you're diagnosed with cancer as a young adult, it is very isolating. Co-founder Amanda Rice has beaten cancer three different times. Rice froze her eggs, but it wasn't covered by insurance. Chick Mission works with 35 fertility partners in eight states, helping families save more than $7 million in fertility preservation costs. If you live in the eight states where we currently work, you're diagnosed, you haven't started fertility th threatening treatment yet, you make under $150,000 per year. They're need-based. Okay. Wow. Um, we're gonna we're gonna cover your fertility preservation. Wow. Only 18 states offer fertility coverage. Rice helped change the law in Oklahoma last year. Data from the National Center for Health Statistics shows more than 49,000 Americans died by suicide in 2022, nearly as many as the year before. While these numbers are at an all-time high. Experts are cautiously optimistic we're at a turning point as mental health becomes less stigmatized. Talking about depression, talking about mental health, openly talking about suicide. Um, the more people hear about it, the more likely they're going to be to reach out when they need help because they feel like it's not a taboo topic. Suicide was the 11th leading cause of death for all ages in 2022, but the second leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 14 and 20 to 34. 
Brittany Elko lost her 23-year-old brother Derek to suicide in 2015. And he struggled with anxiety and depression, and I think there just wasn't enough understanding around what his struggles were. Um, I think he was open to therapy and getting help, but again, the topic was so stigmatized. Firearm use was the leading means of suicide death for women and men in 2022. If you or someone you know is in crisis, call or text the Suicide Lifeline by dialing 988. Coming up, cancer treatment that can be used on humans and their pets, and how extreme heat is sending more kids to the hospital. high-tech kind of radiation designed for people is now also being used for dogs and cats with cancer. Stephanie Stahl has more from Malvern, Pennsylvania. Cleo, an 11-year-old Sheltie, is visiting from Rochester, New York, getting treatments for a cancerous brain tumor that's caused seizures. It was a surprise, obviously. Um, I mean, she's been so active. Cleo is Lily Cagle's best friend. She's at the Blue Pearl Vet Hospital at the recommendation of her New York vet. They said surgery was possible, but based on where it was, it just wasn't the best. Instead, Cleo is having cyber knife treatments, a pinpointed kind of radiation that's also used on people. Really the name of the game in radiation is getting that dose of radiation to the tumor, but sparing all the healthy structures around it. Siobhan Haney, a radiation oncologist at Blue Pearl, says she treats dogs and cats from all over the country. This is the only veterinary dedicated cyber knife in the world. She says before the treatment, the tumor is carefully mapped with an MRI and CT scan. And so you use this imaging to kind of focus Correct. the cyber knife. That's exactly right. Before the procedure, the doctor says Cleo gets some anesthesia and feels nothing during the radiation that kills the cancer cells. There's no knife, no knifing involved. Um, the, uh, the makers of CyberKnife were trying to draw an analogy between the precision of this type of radiation therapy and the precision with which a surgeon would use their scalpel. Dr. Haney says CyberKnife is a good alternative to surgery because it's non-invasive. It really allows an animal to get back to a good quality of life very quickly. Um, and also with minimal side effects. Lily says Cleo has been a little tired, but you'd never know. She's had three cancer treatments as they're now ready to head home. Stephanie Stahl, CBS News. As America's elderly population grows, more than one and a half million people enroll in hospice care every year. The specialized care is meant for people nearing the end of their life. But CBS News chief medical correspondent, Dr. John LaPook, shows us it's not just about death, it's about living and home hospice is changing to help people who are still writing their final chapter. This past spring, Joan Prum's advanced age and increasing frailty ushered in a new reality. Well, at 98, it's whole new territory. <laughs> right. So I think I'm doing pretty well. Now, when you heard the word hospice, what did that oh, I, mean to you? I thought that unless you were really infirm and bedridden, uh, you wouldn't be a candidate for hospice. But it turns out not to be true. Healthcare teams provide comfort to hospice patients expected to live no longer than six months. As with all palliative care, trained professionals offer medication and treatments to decrease pain and increase quality of life. But with hospice, attempts to cure a person's illness are stopped. Some people are afraid of that word. They think, oh, oh hospice, oh, it means... Indeed, I'm... indeed. I just thought, well, anyone mentioning hospice is, is the beginning of the end. Founded 50 years ago, Connecticut Hospice was the first in the nation and oversees Joan Prum's care. Barbara Pierce is the CEO. So it's really hard to predict how long somebody has to live. Who makes the decision? The patient. The patient and their families. Routine hospice services average about $200 a day and are covered by Medicare, Medicaid, and most private insurance plans. But only about half of Medicare patients use it. Hospice care involves sitting down at the very beginning and say, what are your goals of care? What do you want your life to look like in the next few months, and how can we help? Hospice care can be given in nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and places like Connecticut Hospice. 
but about 99% choose to receive services at home, just like former President Jimmy Carter and Joan Prum. Did the fact that you had heard about hospice through President Carter help you there? Oh, yes. It certainly made it the thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think President Carter and his family going public saying he's entering hospice meant for the hospice movement? He's given everybody permission to consider that as a reasonable option that doesn't shorten their life, but does increase their comfort and fulfillment. Joan Prom still cooks and can mostly navigate her Connecticut apartment on her own. So you're going to show me what's in the refrigerator? Oh, it's pretty stocked. Got fruit. What else is in here? But she depends on hospice staff and other visitors to keep her safe and engaged. Are there things that you want to stay oh, around for? Oh, mostly my grandchildren. That's it. How many grandchildren do you have? Eight. Wow. Yes. And, and they're spectacular. Initially, you thought it was the beginning of the end? Right. And now? I'm not over yet. I'm not through yet. And with the help of home hospice, she is savoring every precious moment. Dr. John LaPook, CBS News. New research shows a worrying trend. Extreme heat is sending more kids to emergency rooms with dangerous illnesses. Natalie Brand has the numbers. <laughs> Tiffany Forand and her son Hunter love to play outdoors, so she makes sure they stay hydrated in the L.A. sun. I think no matter what, every time we go out, we always have water. Data shows climate change is leading to more and more record-breaking temperatures. Now new research at two large children's hospitals finds the number of kids visiting the ER for heat-related illnesses has increased by 170 percent over a decade. As we see temperatures increasing, we know that heat-related illness is going to continue increasing as well. We have seen in other studies about 50% of those incidents occur in children. So we know that children are a highly vulnerable population. Symptoms can include high body temperature, headache, dizziness, and confusion. The study presented at an American Academy of Pediatrics conference shows two groups coming to the ER, school-age kids with heat stroke and exhaustion not needing to be hospitalized, and teenage boys with a serious condition that causes muscle breakdown more likely to be admitted. For our really young children, it's making sure that they're not in an in a environment where they can be really susceptible to heat. And for our older children, making sure they're dressed appropriately in light, loose-fitting clothing and that they always have access and you're encouraging them to drink fluids. Really important for our athletes. We recommend a period of 10 to 14 days for them to really slowly increase how much they're exercising so their bodies can get used to these temperatures. If it is way too hot, we're not going to go outside or we're going to play in the water. This mom takes all precautions so her son can stay safe. Natalie Brand, CBS News. After the break, an astronaut's biggest challenge had nothing to do with going to outer space. And what Gloria Estefan, the queen of Latin pop, is doing to find a cure for paralysis. Welcome back. 91-year-old Ed Dwight is the oldest man to ever travel to space, but the greatest obstacle he says he's ever overcome was right here on Earth. And now he wants other men to take notice. Kelly Worthman explains from Colorado. Going and going 100 miles an hour, you know. Actually, just six months ago, Ed Dwight was going more than 2,000 miles an hour as he rocketed into space. And it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen when you start looking down at the Earth. Oh. It was a historic journey for the now 91-year-old astronaut, the launch also marking nearly one year since he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I, I was pretty knocked off my feet. What in the world? How did that happen? <laughs> good morning. All right, good morning. Dr. Juan Montoya is part of Mr. Dwight's cancer care team at Advent Health, where Ed received dozens of rounds of radiation. The decision to treat uh, really made sense, uh, you know, for him. And so I think that's what's important is that we, you know, we strive to personalize treatment approaches to the individuals. And As with any cancer, early detection is key. For prostate cancer, it's recommended men begin screenings as early as 45 years old. It's just a simple blood draw. It takes a moment to do. It's not very uncomfortable. It's not something to be ashamed of because it happens and 
and, and, it, and it's more prevalent than people think. All the more reason why Ed is encouraging men to take charge of their health. He says ask a lot of questions and always take on life's challenges and triumphs with a positive attitude. Kelly Worthman, CBS News, Denver. Gloria Estefan survived a tour bus crash in 1990 that left her temporarily paralyzed. And since then, she's been working to help find a cure. The queen of Latin pop didn't let that accident slow down her career. Estefan has sold more than 100 million records worldwide, won eight Grammy Awards, and received the Presidential Medal of Freedom and a Kennedy Center honor. Last year, she became the first Hispanic woman to be inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Estefan is using all her success to help fund her cause, donating more than $42 million to paralysis research efforts. You know, I just feel so blessed. I want to be a part of this cure. The singer works with the Miami Project, a research center looking for therapeutic strategies for spinal cord and traumatic brain injuries. And we've made amazing strides. We're already using uh, interfaces with the brain to help muscles move, wow. along with so many incredible research projects that they have. Estefan's father spent the last years of his life in a wheelchair due to multiple sclerosis, and at one point she feared her paralysis could be permanent. Instead, she's now working with her daughter on a Broadway play and is recording a Spanish language album. And another story about the healing power of music. Hospitals across the country are using tunes to help treat some of their youngest patients. The American Cancer Society estimates about 9,600 American children younger than 15 will be diagnosed with cancer in 2024. Researchers at a New York hospital are working to make music therapy more accessible. Jared Hill has the story. A one, two, a one, two. Sometimes a jam session is just what the doctor ordered. It really just helps me like relax. Emma Zonazer is a little kid with a lot going on. She was diagnosed with neuroblastoma, a common type of pediatric cancer, in February of 2020. Now, just 10 years old, music therapy, especially this kind, is helping her find something else to focus on. What do you like about improvising? No rules. No rules. We know that it can uh, certainly help with coping. Karen Popkin is a music therapist with MSK Kids. At the New York City Hospital, she and other music therapists mix in a dose of melody to the medicine for pediatric patients. Being able to be creative, to make your sound in the world is one way to, to stay true to who you are, no matter what you're going through. Researchers at Memorial Sloan Kettering are also studying the effectiveness of music therapy compared to traditional talk therapy, even after cancer treatment is finished. A lot of research have demonstrated uh, cancer survivors continue to feel high level of anxiety, symptoms of trauma, fear of recurrence, those psychological uh, symptoms are not adequately managed. They think the universal nature of music can help people who may not be interested in talking out their feelings. They also hope this research leads to more insurance coverage for music therapy. I like doing it with another person, like feeling the flow of the music. Composing more moments like this. Jared Hill, CBS News, New York. Yeah. <laughs> Music that heals the soul and helps the body. That's this week's Eye on Health. I'm Bradley Blackburn. Thanks for joining us and be well.